Honourable Member for Vermilion Lloydminster. Not already? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I hadn't anticipated in speaking this early in the debate, but I will happily take the opportunity certainly to speak on a topic that has, uh, uh, well, I would say in the rather short time that I've been here, uh, rivaled any in terms of the level of uh, engagement from my constituents, and not just from my constituents, but from Albertans all around the province. Now, Mr. Speaker, I think as uh, I've probably bored the assembly with enough, as you know, I've, uh, I'm a large animal veterinarian. I was in mixed practice in Lloydminster for close to 30 years, but uh, perhaps what people don't know is that I was actually born and raised in Edmonton. I'm a city, I'm a city kid. And, uh, and uh, I was, uh, you know, and I was, I was exposed to a farm life as a child. My uncle and aunt and my seven cousins farmed uh, between San Gudo and Barhead in the Garden View District between the Paddle and Pemina Rivers, and we would go out there on Sundays usually. And it all depended on whether or not it was a day that my father, who was a butcher, was doing butchering out on farm butchering, open air abattoir, uh, out on the farm. Um, perhaps there were, that's where I got my initial interest in anatomy. I can't actually sunlight speculate. Is, sunlight is the best. But uh, I will tell you that it was uh, it was interesting. And uh, some years later, as a teenager, I worked on a uh, small farm near Ardrossan, and that was when I first got the taste of working with animals that were large animals. Prior to that, I had actually planned on going only into small animal practice, but my employer at that time, he teased me. He said, you don't want to be a poodle mechanic. You want to be a real vet. You want to be a real veterinarian that looks after real animals. And I had my first exposure to uh, horses. Prior to that, I was actually quite frightened of horses, but as a 14-year-old, I had a lot of experience working with horses. I found that I really enjoyed them. And I, that I also enjoyed cattle. I think that's where I was first exposed to cattle. I did some work with the cows that, uh, those two summers. And uh, then uh, some years later, after two years of agriculture here at the University of Alberta, that was when I went to the University of Saskatchewan to do my four years of study in veterinary practice, graduating in 1983. And I will tell you, it was at the time that I was, dur during the time that I was at school, that I was exposed to uh, the opportunity to work with large animals and work with farmers, that I became enamored with mixed practice, as we call it, multi-species veterinary practice. That and all of the James Harriet books, which I thought were really, really cool. And so in 1983, I moved to Lloydminster, but I was still very much a city kid. I'd worked for a couple of summers in veterinary practices. One summer that I worked, I worked in the uh, city of Camros. And that was where I had my first exposure to the dedication of farmers that have animals. Um, it, was a, it was a fascinating, it was a real watershed moment in my life because that was when I realized that the clock doesn't matter, the calendar doesn't matter, whether it's your birthday or your anniversary or the weekend doesn't matter. Your work is dictated by the animals you care for. And that was a philosophy that I adopted early on in veterinary practice and, and had throughout my veterinary practice. Animals have a very poor concept of clock or calendar. I will tell you that right now. And uh, the number of times that I was called away on calls, especially on you know, the birthdays of my sons or on my anniversary or at other times, um, that was just something that happened. And, it, it, and what I learned though is that farmers put the needs of their animals ahead of their own. And they put the needs as well, not just in the case of animals, but they put the needs of the crops that they tend, the land that they are the stewards of, they put those needs also ahead of their own. And I learned some very profound lessons as a young veterinarian. I started practicing when I was 22. And as a young veterinarian, I gained a lot of experience. You know, I would even say, in those, especially in those first five, 10 years of practice, I learned a lot more from my clients than they learned from me. And one of the lessons that one of my clients, I remember who's now passed on, told me, he said, son, he said, one thing that we learn if we look after our cows, our cows will look after us. You know, that was a lesson, he says, look after, we look after our cows and our cows look after us. 
That was, I think, uh, the same time that I had unfortunately suffered the first death of a patient. And uh, while well, I felt very, I felt terrible, I felt terrible about it. It wasn't really my fault, but it was just one of those things that happens. And this same client uh, put his arm around my shoulder and he said, son, if you're going to have livestock, you're going to have dead stock. And uh, it was one of those, you know, lessons is simple, very clearly set, a lesson that I'll never forget. So I say all these things, Mr. Speaker, because the appreciation for what farming is all about is one that can only be gained over time. And I would, uh, I would actually say that probably until I had practiced for five to ten years, until I had been married to my wife who was a farm-raised girl for five to ten years, it was only then that I think I really gained an appreciation for the level of dedication that, pe that farmers have to their work and their lifestyle. Working with kids in 4-H clubs, was absolutely a joy for me. One of the things they had me do quite often was judge public speaking competitions, which I really quite enjoyed. And uh, I, worked with, uh, I worked with the students and we talked a lot about different means and you know the things that they learned by directly doing them, by putting the trust and the confidence in these young people and that is why I would suggest to you there is so much concern uh, over these, these, uh, this legislation, especially from the 4-H community, because 4-H is one of those institutions in Alberta that is so highly prized. You know, I can remember going up to my cousin's place when I was a youngster and seeing their trophy cases filled with 4-H trophies and being jealous because the only trophies I had at home were for my prowess as an accordion player and that was just kind of geeky by comparison. Oh, no. And, uh, and so, Mr. Speaker, it, it, was, uh, it was something, you know, that you gained this appreciation for being, uh, for, for the 4-H movement. So, over time, I want to say that I have gained an appreciation for farmers, for the farming way of life, for the fact that really farmers were a big part of the reason why our business, our veterinary practice was successful, why it remains successful to this day. And the whole concept of you look after your cows and your cows will look after you, we extended essentially and just changed one word. And I said to all of my colleagues, they said, if we look after our clients, our clients will look after us. Now, in the course of this debate, we've heard quite often that Alberta is the only province that doesn't currently have farm safety legislation. You know, I, I sometimes worry about that justification. Alberta is also the only province that doesn't have a sales tax. Now, one would hope that you know the fact that we're an outlier on the sales tax front doesn't uh, stimulate this government to, to saying, "Well, gee, we've got to come into line with all the other provinces." The one thing that I will say, Mr. Speaker, and it's a thing that I think that we can agree on, and it's one of the aspects of this debate that really bothered me, is that the impetus behind a lot of this debate over the last 10 years was due to a specific fatality where the farm worker in question was not readily compensated. His family was not readily covered for the injuries, in this case the fatality, and uh, you know, it's been mentioned that sometimes that involves taking legal action. I think that there is broad agreement amongst our all parties that farm workers, employed farm workers, on large commercial and corporate operations should have some sort of financial safety net to look after them and to look after their families in the event of an injury or death. I think that that's something that we could get agreement on and probably move forward on. There's a second area that I think we have broad agreement on and that is currently we do not have a mechanism within this province for doing adequate reporting of farm, uh, of farm in incidents, accidents, and fatalities. There isn't a way to go in and do a proper investigation as to how and what could be improved to prevent that from happening down the road. Most farmers I talk to, even those that are vehemently opposed to Bill 6, say that that makes sense to them, that it makes sense that that is a provision that should be there. And so, Mr. Speaker, I think there are areas that we could move forward on, that there are broad areas of agreement. 
And I would prefer, rather than trying to, and I'm going to use a football analogy, we just had the great cup, rather than throwing the long bomb and trying to score the touchdown right off day one, that we would be better off running the ball up the middle and making some short passes and making a few first downs and moving the ball down the field gradually and making the progress we can make and that we can all agree on. You know, this was the approach that was taken in some of the other provinces as they introduced farm legislation. And what you have in that scenario is you have the introduction of something to a group of people who are fiercely proud of their way of life. And if you cannot sense that from the letters you've been getting, the calls you've been getting, the demonstrations on the front step, if you can't sense that, then I'm sorry, your political antenna need adjusting. Okay, you need to, you know, have a real adjustment as far as where things stand, what you're hearing from constituents. The farmers are not resistant. Let's be very clear if we had this discussion. Farmers are not against the concept of farm safety. It's been said before, it will be said again, that they are absolutely committed to keeping themselves, keeping their children, and keeping those that work for them as safe as possible. To suggest otherwise, quite frankly, is insulting to farmers, and I have heard that, and I've heard that from a, a number of people, and I just find that that just lowers the quality of debate. So let's flush that away right away. Let's at least agree that farmers aren't careless about safety issues. I just, you know, that very suggestion really bothers me. And so, when we move ahead with this, you know, I think one of the things that we really should do is move forward on those parts that can be agreed on. And there are some that can be agreed upon. I'm not sure that we can adequately um, change the current legislation because the problem with the current legislation is all it does, it, it's such a short piece of legislation, it's enabling legislation to remove the exemption from four separate pieces of legislation, codes and regulations, but it removes that you know, that right now that exemption and throws the farming industry wide open to every single regulation, every single stipulation within those four acts, regulations and codes. And if you wonder why farmers have been concerned and now being accused of misinterpreting the legislation, it's because the information they have been given has not been adequate so they know exactly how this legislation will affect their farm. And that is a failure of communi communication, Mr. Speaker, and that has plagued the government in this particular initiative. We'll continue to. The whole way the government has gone about this particular piece of legislation is seriously, seriously flawed. The consultation process has already been talked about as to just how bad it is. And there's no question that the consultation process has got some very significant problems. There were 500 people in Red Deer today. Most of the other meetings were full. Now the halls have been expanded. That's a good, that's a good thing that they are. But a number of those sessions are already full. I'm hosting a town hall session in Vermilion this Saturday. I know that there's concerns that the 325 people that can go into the senior center, that that won't be enough for the number of people that are coming. People care, and they care deeply about this. And so, to, you know, so for this consultation process to be happening essentially after the legislation is passing, that, that pattern by itself does not engender trust. Legislating first and then consulting after the fact, that just simply does not engender trust. And I will tell you that in any relationship, whether it's a personal relationship, a business relationship, or a political relationship, once trust is broken, it is very, very difficult to rebuild. If trust is broken, it only takes one thing that breaks trust, it takes then months, years of consistent, trustworthy behavior, behavior that is undertaken with integrity to rebuild that trust. And anybody who has uh, been through a situation where the trust has been broken within a relationship, business, personal, political, whatever type of relationship, will know that this is true. And so the trust has been broken and, and that now is left to the government to rebuild it. And I would suggest 
with respect to the government that if you want to rebuild the trust with farmers, the best way to do it is going to be to pause this process and indicate that you will actually meaningfully, respectfully listen to people and, oh, while you're at it, you might, it might not hurt to admit that you didn't do a really great job from the outset. Thank you.